Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a muggy and crappy Florida. You know, I don't even know what day it is and I don't care. Uh, it's all the same at this point. They're just flowing into each other one after the other. Uh, so, and I'm just, you know, I've bitched about the weather for the last few days. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to pause on it for a few days because what difference does it make at this point, honestly? Uh, it really is all the same. I can't actually see because my glasses are fogged up. Uh, I've also had no sleep. I'm hungover. Uh, I'm fresh off more coronavirus whiskey therapy. And a very kind gentleman actually sent me some uh, Jim Beam therapy whiskey, which uh, I have used, at least one of them. There were two bottles and uh, a uh, DVD as well, which was fascinating. But uh, I have to say, people out there are very, very kind, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate stuff like that. Uh, the guys at work are befuddled by it. Uh, I also got a lovely car magazine from the uh, 1960s with, uh, you know, it's always fascinating to look at the classifieds in those, as the gentleman pointed out, where you could buy a 300 SL Gullwing for uh, pennies on the dollar, and uh, it just makes you want to go back in time and start a car collection, but yeah, no DeLoreans in sight, so I guess we're going to have to keep going along life poor and making soup out of ketchup, and wow, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. But anyway, I can tell already that this one's not going to go well. I mean, it's not just the physical condition of the hangover, the uh, intellectual moronic capacity that I've got going on this morning. Uh, I'm just not that well-versed with Chrysler. I know that's a shame because Chrysler made some of the finest and most incredible muscle cars of the 60s and early 70s. I mean, they're synonymous with muscle car. There is nothing more muscle car than the 60s Mopars. There really isn't. The crazy color the crazy engines, the options, the cartoonish figures, literally, like Roadrunner and Duster. Uh, not that uh, Duster was widely considered a muscle car, but we'll get into this. But uh, anyway, uh, it's really a topic that I should know pretty well. Uh, but I've always been a GM guy, and I hated Fords as a kid, so I was a Ford guy so I could hate them. And that uh, that was it. Uh, Mopars in, in my teens, they just, you know, they didn't amount to much. There wasn't anyone who drove one then. Uh, you didn't see any Hemi Chargers running around my high school. And most of the new stuff from Chrysler was all front-wheel drive like that Daytona we did the other day and uh, just didn't have the same uh, uh, the same joy for me so uh, Chrysler's escaped my early childhood and uh, I'm only catching up now so bear with me on this one I don't claim to be any sort of an authority on Chrysler's at all and uh, getting into this is uh, just stuff that I've kind of put together a little bit from memory and a little bit from research but uh, anyway if you go back into the set I mean you've got the 60s going on and most Muscle cars are raging. Everybody wants super high horsepower crap. Uh, they're loving it. Uh, family sedan wise, things are getting bigger and more expensive and enormous. And yet there's still a demand for smaller economical cars as evidenced by uh, the absolute success of, for instance, the Volkswagen Beetle. So uh, Ford, Chrysler, and uh, GM promised the public that they were gonna come out with some subcompacts and compacts to compete with them. And they did. Uh, you know, the Beetle inspired the Corvair, uh, another air-cooled rear-engine car that was killed by, um, uh, excuse me, I'm belching up whiskey. That's lovely, absolutely lovely. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, the Corvair was killed by um, Ralph Nader and his, uh, you know, over-the-top histrionics. Uh, the Valiant came out from uh, Chrysler and, yeah, did fairly well. And the Ford Falcon uh, was working as a subcompact car. Uh, but, uh, you know, you get towards the end of the 60s, uh, the Corvair is gone, the way of the dodo bird, again, thanks to Nader. Uh, the Falcon is fading away, soon to be replaced by the Maverick. And uh, the Valiant is the only one that's going to have any kind of a future. And the reason it has a future is because of this car, the Plymouth Duster. In 69, uh, late 69, it was released, and it was the result of a $15 million, which wasn't much, uh, but a $15 million shove to the uh, engineers to overhaul the Valiant for the next uh, iteration. And uh, instead of doing what they probably should have done, which is just sort of butter up the uh, Valiant, what they decided to do instead was make a two-door 
sport coupe out of the money using all of the Valiant hardware, uh, all of the Valiant frame, I mean everything. And uh, they created the duster out of that. And despite it being kind of a weird harebrained idea, it sold like hotcakes. People went absolutely nuts for it. And uh, it became uh, the reason that Chrysler ended up with a big chunk of the compact market, well more than their share of the overall market. And uh, quite a few dusters were running around everywhere. Pretty much everybody knew somebody who had a duster. Uh, they just did. I mean, it was just a, a car that was absolutely prolific at the time and uh, really appealed to a lot of people. And one of the reasons it did was because it was a tremendous value for the money. Uh, the car was pretty cheap and it still gave you, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that you really would have wanted. I mean, it was rear drive, uh, V8 engine up front. You could get a six, but uh, two different V8s you could choose from. Lots of space inside, plenty of room, of course, because it was based on the four-door Valiant, uh, which, by the way, was also the sister car to the Barracuda, and uh, this duster in particular borrowed a little bit from that, but we'll get into that. And um, people just enjoyed it. They really went nuts for it, and they bought them. And uh, this one, the 73, uh, was the Space Pack Duster. Well, it had that option. And uh, we'll get into that, of course, in a minute. But uh, one thing that's interesting about the Duster is that uh, it became sort of a giant killer. Uh, in 1970, you could get a 340 Duster, which had all the tidbits the 340 had and some of the, um, you know, like in the Challenger and whatnot. It had high compression. It had manual gearbox. It had posi traction rear end. Uh, of course, unibody construction. Um, uh, what the hell is that? The, oh, for the love of God. Uh, you see, I told you this wasn't going to go well. I got stuck on a torsion bar. <laughs> front, front suspension. Yeah, stuck on that. Oh, God. Anyway, and it turned out that that little uh, duster was uh, something of a giant killer in 340 form. Uh, it was pretty damn quick, uh, and it was selling well enough that Dodge wanted its own version of it. So they got the Demon, uh, the Dodge Demon, which, of course, uh, is a name that's gone on to bigger and better things. Uh, that was originally going to be the Dodge Beaver, by the way, uh, until Dodge executives figured out that uh, Beaver was slang for, uh, eh, you know, certain anatomical female parts in trucker lingo, so uh, the name Demon was brought out. But of course, that pissed off the Christian coalition at some point, and uh, they didn't want demons running around, so they had to change that. Uh, Dodge really did have some interesting stuff going on. Uh, if you remember, they had the Roadrunner, uh, which was licensed from Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers decided they didn't charge enough for that, so when uh, Dodge made the duster and wanted to use the Tasmanian Devon logo, uh, Warner Brothers named a ridiculous price that uh, Dodge refused to pay. So they came up with their own little, uh, you know, Fergazy, Fergazy, whatever you want to call it, Duster logo based on the Tasmanian Devil, but it wasn't. So uh, it's just, I don't know, it's just an interesting time. And frankly, Chrysler is a uh, very interesting car company, or at least they were back then. Uh, in return for the Duster and Dodge, uh, Chrysler, sorry, Plymouth got the uh, they got the Dodge Dart, and it was called the Plymouth Scamp, the Valiant Scamp. Uh, the Dart had a hot rod version called the Swinger. You know, what the hell was going on over at Dodge and Chrysler in the, uh, in the 1970s? You've got Swingers and Beavers and Dusters and... Yeah, anyway, pretty, uh, again, interesting car company, but... Um, so anyway, they had many different variations of this car. Because it proved popular, they started doing trim packages on it, and with all kinds of stripes and graphics. And uh, the amount of, between 70 and 76, when the duster was out, they had like 83, and I'm making up that number. It's probably more like 14, but uh, like 83 different trim packages you could get. There was the gold duster, uh, there was the feather duster, which came out later, which was a lightweight version, the silver duster, uh, the duster twister, uh, the 340 duster, the 360 duster. Uh, it just, I can't even remember them all. It just goes on and on and on. There was shitloads of different duster packages, and uh, they really did appeal to a wide variety of people, and uh, people did buy them in droves. <laughs> 
and I can see why. Uh, anyway, this one is a 1973. Uh, it is a space pack duster uh, because it has fold down rear seats, uh, which really it robbed from its sister car, the Barracuda, which that had in the early 60s. Uh, the Barracuda was also on this A platform uh, initially until it changed to become uh, tied in with the uh, Challenger, I believe, later on, uh, while this A platform continued on with the uh, with the duster. Uh, this car was replaced by, um, eh, you know, what the hell, I can't even remember what the hell it was replaced by. Uh, I won't... All right, it was replaced by the Dodge Valare and the Plymouth Aspen. Uh, maybe I have that backwards, actually. It's probably the Plymouth Valare and the, uh, and the Dodge Aspen. <laughs> maybe even the Chrysler Aspen. Now it was the Dodge Aspen. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, when this thing came out, it competed not just with the Beetle, uh, although that wasn't really its intended market, but it did compete with it. People might have bought a Beetle, might have bought a Duster. More directly, it competed with the Chevy Nova and uh, Ford's new, uh, what is going on over there? Absolute mayhem. Uh, anyway, it competed with the Chevy Nova and Ford's Maverick, which had replaced the Falcon, uh, and uh, and it did quite well against them. It had the same sort of semi-fastback design as the Nova. It had the same V8 power options as the Nova, uh, although it did not have the four-door version, which the Nova did, although I suppose you could have gone with a, uh, a Valiant if you wanted that. So uh, anyway, you know, there it was, and it did it all for a lot less. And if you got into the high po versions of this car, the 340 and the 360, uh, not only did they beat the price of other muscle cars like, for instance, the Mustang Mach or uh, the Nova SS by a considerable amount of money, uh, there was also for at least a little while a little workaround on high insurance costs because you'd go to your insurance guy and say, yeah, I'm driving a Duster and uh, you know, or a Dodge Demon. Uh, you didn't mention that it had the big 340 or 360 hypo option and you could save a thousand dollars a year on insurance. I actually had no idea insurance had become that expensive back then, but I guess in the early 70s, uh, if you drove a hot rod, a real muscle car, uh, they were charging like 1200 bucks a year for insurance on them because I guess a bunch of kids were plowing into everybody and killing people. So uh, it wasn't that easy to have a, uh, a muscle car insured back then. And uh, the duster with its little secret high performance packages did manage to, uh, to circumvent invent that, at least for a little while. Of course, the insurance guys figured it out eventually. Uh, but Dusters, you know, they survived as sort of this really interesting platform. And while, you know, many, many Mopars have exploded in value, the Duster sort of lagged behind. Uh, even the high-performance versions, the 3, 4, they've gotten more expensive now. Uh, of course, everything has. But uh, for many years, they did represent a bit of a bargain in the uh, collector car world. Uh, they also made great street or track, uh, you know, drag strip vehicles that you could buy and hot rod for very little money, uh, almost the way you could put in a, you know, a big well, probably not a big buy, but a 350 Chevy and a Vega or something, or a, uh, you know, a Ford V8 and a Maverick. Uh, yeah, the bigger the engine and the smaller the car equals speed, and uh, that did uh, work very well for people who hot rod a duster. So, uh, anyway, I'm going to pause for a minute and get my glasses clean, wipe some of the sweat off my brow, and then we'll just get into this car. And I already do have to apologize for that convoluted description of the duster. Please forgive me. Uh, I really am not at my best today, but hopefully some of the crap got through. Uh, anyway, give me a minute and we'll continue. All right, so I have to say that, you know, Peter first revving his Kubota and then his Pagoda uh, and then needing help pushing shit around the garage is not helping with my already diminished condition. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's hot, it's muggy, the sun's now too high to be doing this, but I have to continue because I've got half of it done and uh, otherwise... You know, for a Tuesday, it sure feels a hell of a lot like a Monday. Uh, anyway, let's just get into this car. We'll get this over with. Now, if you look up uh, in Webster's Dictionary, uh, one of the most overused words about cars ever, which is survivor, I've been guilty of that myself, uh, you're in fact going to see a picture of this particular car uh, next to the article. I mean... I cannot describe to you what an incredible time machine this thing is. I mean, you want to talk about the proverbial little old lady car from North Carolina. 50,000 actual miles, original paint and top, original interior, uh, original ridiculous hubcaps, and 
God, there is more revving going on. So 914, for Christ's sake. Uh, anyway, I just have never seen a car preserved in this state. I mean, it's kind of a miracle that some delinquent teen didn't get a hold of this thing, put Krager SS's on it in the Holly 4 barrel, you know? I mean, this thing has survived uh, in precisely the way that it was built from the factory, and uh, that's a really neat thing to see. We got some documents with it, uh, including an inspection report from, uh, I don't know, some like, a couple of years, maybe a year ago, uh, from uh, some shop in New York, so um, I'll include that with the photos of the car so you can get a feel for what uh, you know a non-biased guy looking at it would have said but uh, to me this is just an unbelievable survivor uh, here you can see this little partition is now folded down I didn't want to click all this in because it's hard to do one-handed but uh, you can see those releases there in the back so uh, you pull those down this little carpeted thing falls uh, you come over to this side and let's open up the door we've got a split folding bench seat here and uh, pull this rear seat down <laughs> and look at this you have a ridiculous amount of cargo space in this car and uh, that probably was another reason uh, these dusters did pretty well you could uh, you could fit all kinds of crap in there uh, in fact I believe there was a hang 10 version of the duster amongst all the trillion other ones uh, that was surf based and uh, they advertised that you could run your surfboards in the back so uh, really and honestly pretty neat stuff from uh, Chrysler this vintage uh, you can see another lovingly applied jacking sticker in the back. I don't know who they picked to put those on, but, you know, you want to talk about somebody who didn't have love for their jobs, whether they worked at Ford, Chrysler, or GM. I mean, they just slapped it on there like they didn't give a crap. Maybe you get bored of it after a while. Uh, on the feather duster, all of these hinges would have been aluminum. The transmission case would have been aluminum. And uh, it saved, I don't know, like 5% over the weight of a normal duster. And then they put in really tall gears for the highway, uh, a uh, one-barrel carburetor on a slant six. And the thing ended up with like 36 miles to the gallon. One of the most economical... Uh, cars out there. Why didn't that close properly before I do something stupid? Let me see. Uh, close fine. Uh, this ridge was something they had to put in uh, because initially it wasn't there on the first few uh, dusters and people ended up denting the, uh, the trunk when they closed it. Have a look under the hood. God, I can just tell this is a bad video. <laughs> really can. Yeah, I may put a disclaimer at the front that it's probably better to just skip past this one. I have a very hard time opening that. Okay, so here it is. Here is a Chrysler uh, 318 V8 with a two-barrel. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's rated for uh, 230 horsepower, which ain't bad. Uh, the uh, 340 version was really only 230, so not a ton more. Uh, this hilarious big twin-piston uh, air compressor or AC compressor, it looks like the engine on the front of one of those Morgans that we did the other day, the, uh, uh, the three-wheel cycle Morgans or a Harley V twin or something. I mean, it's just the funniest air, uh, air conditioning compressor I've seen. Uh, you can see the condition of this one with all the metal in there. It's just unbelievable the way this car was preserved. Uh, did have an electronic ignition. I think that also helped with fuel mileage as did the two barrel and uh, just, you know, Nothing special, just a 318 under here, but for some reason it's just a joy for me to look at. I like seeing all these uh, original stickers everywhere. Here's a stamped uh, VIN plate. Uh, I'm not sure what information that gives you. More of the original stickers here, and it's just kind of cool to see something in this state of preservation. Uh, really, really neat uh, and fun car. Detroit my single unit air conditioning. Nice stuff. And I did not close that properly. Uh, in 73, it got these big retarded looking bumperettes because of uh, the new um, uh, five mile an hour bumper laws. I imagine a lot of guys probably pulled those off. It's rare to see one on there. I mean, they are ridiculous looking. They look like battering rams. Uh, also, the grill changed uh, for uh, 1973 and some of the other uh, styling cues. Uh, still basically the Valiant uh, back to the, uh, eh, the bottoms of the doors or something. But um, uh, you know, definitely a sheet metal and body change for this. It also got new taillights. Uh, they had been flush mounted 
uh, <clears throat> without chrome, and now they're, you know, surface mounted with uh, chrome surrounds, which uh, were cheaper than the originals, but probably looked uh, more expensive while uh, being easier to service. Uh, there you see the Duster logo in the back, that cartoonish thing, and gone was the uh, little Tasmanian devil guy. Makes me wonder if Warner Brothers didn't sue him or something. Uh, and of course, it does have a 1973 North Carolina tag on there, which is kind of cool. I also like the body color gas cap. I think that's pretty nifty. So, all right, I tell you what, uh, let me get my uh, stuff in the car so I can just get ready and go and put this thing behind me and uh, we'll uh, pick it up there in a minute. All right, before we uh, get in, there's just one more quick thing I want to cover that's neat from the styling perspective. And uh, that is, you see the way the side windows rake in on this car from the uh, tops of the doors. The uh, roof is much narrower than the body around it. That's called tumble home uh, styling. And uh, there's a tremendous rake to the side windows. The angle is, uh, you know, certainly not straight up and down. It's very much canted uh, inward towards the roof. and uh, that necessitated some engineering inside the doors with window regulators, new stuff uh, to manage that. Uh, it also sort of did away with the idea that the rear windows would roll down uh, and instead they became these little pop-out affairs uh, without bezels, uh, which is kind of an interesting little setup for venting. And uh, there you go, just another little bit of weird styling. I think that's also what made the duster kind of good looking, uh, is that uh, narrow roofed fastback thing. It just made it sort of appealing and as a testament to the engineers who made it, working with uh, the Valiant platform, you know, having to fit a car around it, they did everything they could. Uh, one thing that bothered them was the inset of the rear wheels. And uh, a duster guy who helped with the design, when he bought one uh, a couple of years later, he ended up putting two-inch spacers in the back to make the car look more normal. Uh, and you can see it here from this angle. It is remarkable uh, how far in those rear uh, uh, tires and wheels are tucked in. In. Uh, and uh, that did not help with handling. I mean, even though the BMW, the 2002, was more than twice as expensive uh, as the Duster, the Duster could out accelerate it, but you get anywhere where there's twisty roads, and this thing would end up in a twisting pile in a tree on the side while the BMW would be smartly pulling away. So uh, the Duster was not necessarily a car that could handle. Oh boy, anyway, and God, on top of the Nova and the Beetle and the Maverick uh, and some other cars, this car also competed with the AMC Hornet. I mean, it really did have a pretty big role to fill uh, and a lot of different cars to compete with. So, uh, yeah, anyway, interesting stuff. Uh, this one ended up with the bench seat with the split back. You could also get bucket seats. You could get a split bench seat. You could get a center console. Uh, you could get a three on the tree. You could get a four on the floor. You could get a, uh, an automatic like this one. They did come with some uh, very different varieties. Uh, you know, it's real Chrysler vanilla stuff. This was not an expensive car, uh, but they did have a higher build quality than cars made later on because, yeah, that was an expectation at the time. So uh, they did not fall apart uh, the way that some of the uh, uh, cars that came afterwards did that might even have been more expensive. Going back to what a survivor this thing is, I mean, even when you look at the little plastic surround on the seatbelt thing, I mean, this would all be ripped and peeled away in 90% of original cars. I mean, Unbe There's a little crash on that one, but it's still just unbelievable to see how well preserved this thing is. The uh, uh, push button still works. Everything still looks nice. Uh, this was just a really funny old lady who had this, I guess. She just kept driving it, and then I think it got stored for a good many years and uh, woken up a few years later. So, anyway, uh, I'd love to know the full history of this car. Unfortunately, when you get them, you don't always get to know that. So, anyway, here it is. A nice big weird three-spoke y-shaped steering wheel with thin incredibly thin as thin as that um uh, Oldsmobile we did yesterday, maybe even thinner, uh, you know, to grip with, but it's got little grippities behind it, which are nice. Uh, you've got your PRNDL indicator there on the uh, column, which uh, this does have a torque flight uh, transmission, good old muscle car tranny. <sighs> 
Good old muscle car slush box. Uh, you've got some gauges in this one. You've got an alternator gauge, a temp gauge, obviously a fuel gauge. So I uh, got something. You got your oil and brake uh, warning lights. You got 120 mile an hour speedo, which we are not burying. I have no idea how old these tires are, but I bet they're not fresh. Uh, I love the little chrome trim around the wood paneling there on the uh, cluster. It all looks neat. Uh, in the sportier versions, the 340s, you could get a tack and probably a couple more gauges. Uh, wiper control over there column shifter all looks nice uh, this one does have in dash navigation lovely stuff and uh, very fancy in dash infotainment in the uh, in the form of an AM AM radio so uh, if you need to listen to some AM this has got you covered uh, here's your vents for the uh, factory air conditioning and it does work miraculously uh, came in working we uh, you know just checked the pressures gave it a little uh, tune-up and it's nice and cold so really really cool. Uh, what the hell is that? That's just your turn signals, which they are the loudest I've ever heard in a car. Uh, over here, you've got a glove box. Nice. What you'd expect. Uh, here's a sheet of stuff that came with it. Uh, there's that inspection I was talking about, which I'll, uh, I'll put on the... Um, uh, put on the website with the photos and uh, I've got an owner's manual somewhere and you know there's some warranty cards and there's a you know original pamphlet and whatnot so yeah nice that it's got some stuff there but I'm telling you man I mean getting in this car and driving it it feels like you're on a used car lot in 1976 I mean the car is just listen to that thing 318 scream of fury through that uh, uh, undoubtedly single exhaust and a um, yeah, maybe it has dual I don't know I have to look underneath uh, it's very nice underneath but I didn't notice whether it did. I just assume it wouldn't have dual exhaust not being the 340 who knows maybe it does but uh, anyway uh, two barrel carb this is not the performance version but it is remarkably peppy get over there and uh, let's go for a spin uh, it does have power steering as well, which, man, thank God, because I am not a guy who likes to, uh, you know, test the strength of my arms by manually steering an old uh, front-engine V8 car. Not at all. And I doubt power steering was standard then. It's when it really meant something. All right, I tell you what, I'm only going to pause after this anyway, so go through the gates and we'll pick it up again at the end of the road. Uh, one of the things I love are those uh, headliner mounted seat belts. I think that's really cool and takes me back. A little bit of wheel spin. There's our 318 torque. No secondaries because we've only got a two barrel. Uh, but man, I mean, feel this thing. For a 1973 model in original condition, it is smooth and easy and comfortable. Nice steering. Uh, what a terrific driver, I really have to say. Uh, this is an impressive car to go down the road in. Nice and straight uh, steering, uh, steady on the uh, uh, steady on the miles per hour. Yeah, I tell you what, man, what a great cruiser. Really, really is. I have been enjoying this. People look at it because they're not quite sure. Uh, I have an Eastern European neighbor, and uh, I, you know, he, he said, "What does something like this cost?" And uh, you know, whatever I told him, he wouldn't have known if it was five grand or fifteen grand or fifty grand. <laughs> he just didn't have a clue. And uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe that's why dusters are starting to pick it up a little bit. Uh, the uh, again, the peppy versions with the spoilers and the purple and all that stuff—they're uh, getting to be ridiculous. They're getting to be uh, north of thirty grand. So uh, these original survivors, even in this sort of uh, old lady form are uh, climbing and climbing so uh, get one while they're cheap if there are any left man again it was a very prolific car in its day but very hard to find one in original preserved condition with a 50,000 uh, actual mile title and original paint uh, also I have a feeling that factory air conditioning might have been a little bit rare in a duster the space back thing is kind of cool too. So anyway, look, I'm not going to keep rambling on. This has got to be one of the most awkward, convoluted, rambling videos I've done yet. And I apologize. I really do. Hopefully through the magic of editing, I could make some sense out of it and uh, cobble something together. Uh, I'm going to try to get a better night's sleep and find something to uh, do for tomorrow. 
uh, that'll make a little bit more sense and uh, be a little bit more properly flowing. So uh, this car will be available at Auto House of Naples uh, on the web at autohousenaples.com or by phone at 239-263-8500. Uh, uh, this is a neat piece, honestly really is. I really, really enjoy this one. Uh, if you have an interest, give those guys a call. Otherwise, we'll have something fun coming up and we will, uh, we will see you with the next one. Take care.